Hello and welcome to End of Life University podcast, where we share real talk about life and death. I'm your host, as always, Dr. Karen Wyatt, and thanks for joining me here for episode number 309. Today, in just a moment, I'll share with you an interview I did with Dr. Joseph Stern, or Jody, as he prefers to be called, who is a prominent neurosurgeon who has written a book called Grief Connects Us, a neurosurgeons lessons on love loss and compassion and it's really a profound book that talks about his own experience at the bedside of his sister while she was dying of leukemia and what he learned about the needs of patients at the end of life and how he is now applying those lessons in his own medical practice so Very interesting interview, and he has so much heartfelt wisdom to share, so uh, stay tuned. I think you'll enjoy that. Before we get started, I just want to say a huge thank you to all of my supporters on my page at patreon.com slash eolu. Thanks for signing up to make a small contribution every month just to keep the podcast on the air. I really appreciate your help so much. So we'll move on now with my interview with Jody Stern. And stay tuned afterwards, I'll come back with a few takeaways and to say goodbye. So here we go. Today, I am very happy to welcome my special guest, Dr. Joseph Stern, or Jody. Dr. Stern is a partner in the country's largest neurosurgical group practice, Carolina Neurosurgery and Spine Associates, and practices neurosurgery at the Moses H. Cohn Hospital, the flagship hospital of Cone Health in Greensboro, North Carolina. He has published three recent essays in the New York Times and is also the author of the book Grief Connects Us, A Neurosurgeon's Lessons on Love, Loss, and Compassion, which details his experiences as his sister was living out her last days with leukemia and also includes conversations with patients and colleagues about the challenges of dealing with life-limiting illness in our current medical system. So, Dr. Stern, Jody, thank you. Thank you so much for taking time out and joining me today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Karen. And I, I should have mentioned already that people can learn more about your, your book and your work at your website, which is josephsternmd.com. So I want to make sure I say that right up front to direct people there. But um, Jody, I, I really enjoyed reading your book. It really touched me in so many ways. And I resonated with uh, so many of the, the things you mentioned in the book as a physician And so I wanted to start by asking you a little bit more about the process you went through during this near, nearly a year of being at the side of your sister and and accompanying her on her journey with leukemia. And I was wondering how that, how that was for you compared with the work you do day to day as a neurosurgeon when you're, you're constantly having to talk to families about life-limiting illness and have difficult conversations. How was it for you being with your own sister? How how different was that being a brother instead of the doctor in this case? Uh, It was a totally, um, it was an absolutely shockingly different experience. And it made me realize that while I thought I had understood what it was like to be a patient or a family member of of a patient, I actually had no clue. And even spending like 20 years as a neurosurgeon and thinking that I was compassionate and caring or empathetic, I just realized that until you walk in the shoes of someone who has such an illness, you have, you, you kind of just have no idea. Um, so that was that was a real shock to me. Um, what started as a as a uh, my sister was an actress and she began to write a journal of her illness and her goal was to. Uh, produce a one woman show about surviving leukemia. And I resolved that I wanted to get her journal in print. And so that was the initial impetus for writing the book. But then I began to under try to work through evolving feelings of, of life and death and what it's like to be a patient. And then also how I needed to grow and do better and uh, become more compassionate. And then I started to look at how we do things. And I realized both I could do better and we all need to do better. So it's been kind of an evolving journey. I wrote, I wrote the book um, 
uh, 10 different drafts before I got it where I think it says what it needs to say. Well, I, I know um, you mentioned in the book that it had taken you some time and probably when you started the book, you had no idea that it would end up being the project that it became. Right. And then, and then halfway through, so when I, when I first wrote it, my, um, and I was dealing with my sister's illness and death, and then a year and a half after she died from uh, acute leukemia and the following a bone marrow transplant, her husband, Pat, had a ruptured brain aneurysm. And I found myself being the healthcare power of attorney for him and having to make decisions to withdraw uh, treatment and to let him die. Uh, and I just just struck by the very tremendous differences between those two experiences. You know, one of the, one of the things was that my sister knew what was going on and and was uh, cognizant throughout her illness, and he was in a coma from the very beginning and never knew what hit him. And it, our decision to stop uh, meant that their two children, their two sons, became orphans. So it was pretty it was a pretty wrenching experience. Yeah, and and I gathered from the book the. <sighs> You know, we view end of life planning and advanced directives in one light as medical practitioners and the importance of those documents and having those documents. And I'm sure that you feel even more so now that those are vital documents. And yet when you're in the position of the person making the decision, the weight of that of that decision is, it, it, at least to me, it feels so much heavier when you're making the decision for a loved one. And I think um, I was in that position with my own mother. And I don't think I ever realized as a doctor just how wrenching it could be and right. how tricky a decision it is. No, I completely agree. And I never, I never knew, uh, you know, it's funny how you counsel people through these experiences, but then when you actually live the experience, you, it just takes on a whole new level of meaning, you know, you wonder if you make the right decision, you kind of wake up in the middle of the night wondering. So. Yes. Oh, yes. And it stays with you. Like it's, it's not something that ever goes away. Like it's something that you carry, carry with you. And I think a lot of times, you know, I've always been in, aware when you counsel a patient or, or counsel a family member, you say, you know, the decision, because I deal with a lot of people with ab, without capacity because they are not um, conscious in, in a lot of times with brain hemorrhages or, or tumors. But you, you always counsel people, you know, the question is not what do you want, but what would your loved one want? And because you're representing their interests. So I found that to be very poignant in that position. Yes. And again, why having written advanced directives is so important, because if we've never had a conversation with our loved one and we have no idea how they feel about these end of life issues, it's even more difficult to try to make decisions on their behalf. Well, it was it's crucial to have that. And one of the things is even having had those discussions with Pat, um, his advanced directive turned out to be locked up in a safe deposit box and we didn't have access to it. And so I had to kind of shoot from the hip and, and sort of make my way through this, um, knowing that that's what he wanted. But uh, I think the key thing more than the document, although I think the document's important, is having those conversations, preparing. I mean, we're all going to die. And uh, so this isn't a mystery. And But yet we tend as a culture to shy away from discussing it or thinking about it or even planning our own death. And I think that a lot of, um, a lot of hardship um, could have been avoided both with, you know, we, I guess with my sister, um, Victoria she did not, it was interesting because she did not want to contend with the idea that she might die. And one of the things I found difficult uh, or one of the byproducts of my work was discovering how much emotional armor or sort of defensiveness I had built up in terms of protecting myself emotionally from the pain and loss and uh, intense feelings that I experienced or was trying to uh, keep uh, detached or distant from as a, as a doctor. But I discovered what, um, you know, for my sister, she wasn't really willing to consider that she might die and had her own sort of defensive armor where she really wasn't interested in discussing the possibility of death. And yet her prognosis, when she was initially diagnosed, she had a, a, a 6% five-year projected survival for her type of leukemia. So it was, it seemed to be a necessary thing to touch on and to discuss because it was inevitable. It was the most likely outcome. 
but she wasn't really interested in going there. So I kind of looked at it from both the angle of wanting to know more as a physician and wanting to have some impact in terms of knowledge, but then also wanting to protect her hopes and dreams and aspirations and desire not to talk about dying. Uh, but it felt as if because she wasn't interested in discussing that, that we never kind of went into what would have been a very powerful um, moment in her life where she could acknowledge that, you know, the, the, the transplant hadn't worked and the chemotherapy that they were giving her wasn't working and that she was likely to die and she would have been able to say goodbye to her family. And she never did. Yeah. And that's something for me as a, a hospice doctor that we in hospice value that so much. We consider that part of our job to make sure that patients have a chance to talk about death and dying with their families and say goodbye and leave their legacies behind for their family members. And so I felt the pain that, that you experienced, and yet you also honored your sister's wishes because it was important to her. And, and I thought about what, what a tricky balance this is. And I think we face it all the time in medicine because at least I hear this from oncologists who tell us, I never mentioned the patient's prognosis because I didn't want to take his hope away mm -hmm. and um, because he needs to keep hoping. And so I struggle that with this in my own mind. Um, I know that hope is important, but is there a way to have a hope that's more realistic that includes the fact that death is a possible outcome? What, what do you think about that? I think it's very strange to exist in a vacuum where you don't even consider the possibility of death. And I think it's very difficult for people to get their hands on, you know, statistical likelihood because an illness is not, you know, you can have statistical boundaries for what may happen, but this isn't what's going to happen to you. So I think a lot of people would, would say, well, I'm not interested in the statistics because I'm, I, that's not going to define me. And yes, that's true, but also there have been a lot of people who have gone through the same experience that you're about to go through or that you're going through, and you can draw on that to give yourself some parameters. I think that I think that um, for my sister, her unwillingness to go there was, I think, largely based in fear. And I wish that her doctors, I guess, I mean, I'm, maybe I avoided it myself because I didn't, but I didn't feel that I could tell her, oh, you know, this is not going to end well. I don't think, but uh, I did feel that her doctors missed some opportunities to have those discussions, particularly toward the latter part of her illness when things really weren't working. And so I feel that by being present and by being uh, compassionate and supportive, you can um, honor the person's wishes and trust, but you also need to, you, you need to be able to open that avenue of conversation to have a meaningful uh, discussion. And if you avoid it, one of the things I think we do a lot in our current medical culture is we throw treatments at people. And even when these treatments aren't necessarily going to be effective or curative, we tend to do that as a form of distraction. And it sort of keeps us busy and keeps us doing things and makes us feel like we're having an impact, even though realistically, sometimes we're not having that much of an impact. So I feel that there it's a two-way street. You know, you have to be, you have to be willing to address that, but at the same time, you don't want to um, destroy hope. But I, I also don't know that, um, you know, it's funny because one of my friends, oncologist, uh, Dr. Magernat, who was in the, in the book, he said, you know, there's no such thing as false hope, there's only hope. And I think that's true. Um, so, but I, I feel that you can end up in a situation where you're doing things and, and offering treatments and going down a path that doesn't feel very, uh, authentic or or positive because it's not likely to help. And in that sense, I feel that you're not really doing a service for someone. You're sort of uh, avoiding the issue. Hmm. That's that's such a good point. And and I do understand that really our society in general avoids the topic of death because I think if it were if it were easier for everyone to talk about death or look at it, these conversations wouldn't be quite so challenging for doctors to have or to bring up with their patients. But when you feel the resistance of the patient that you're working with, it's very hard to overcome that to bring bring up the topic and and say it to them. So I think some doctors 
are waiting until they get an, a bit of an invitation from the patient or sense right. that it, it will be okay to bring this up with the patient. And that sometimes never comes like with your sister. And, and I think that one of the things that would really help is for us as a society to, to insist that we have these conversations when we're not sick. You know, the time to discuss what's going to happen and, and death and dying is probably not when you're actively dying, um, but before when it's more of a concept, you kind of think about it and, and have some ideas and then have some parameters so that then when you find yourself in this position or you find yourself not competent and able to handle your own affairs, that you, you've had these discussions with your family. So it's not just a foreign, a foreign topic. I, oh, I completely agree with that. And as a primary care physician myself, I take on that responsibility for my specialty because we're the people who do all the wellness visits and physicals with our patients. And, and that's the ideal time to say, you know, we should look ahead at the future. There's some planning you should have to do, some decisions you should make, things you should think about and talk to your family about. And, and I really believe that responsibility falls squarely on the shoulders of primary care because we have that opportunity to see patients when they are well, whereas you as a neurosurgeon probably don't very often yeah, get to see this. And, and it really makes a huge difference to have that have had that discussion. I mean, I've, I've rarely in my practice, I've, you know, I've, I've, I don't think I've ever recall being in a contentious situation where someone, where we actually needed to get the document to look at it and say, well, what, what really is being said here? It's more the spirit of the discussion. You know, someone, someone has had that discussion with their family member. They've said that, you know, I don't want extraordinary treatments. Uh, and then you're able to have, you know, kind of a nuanced discussion of, well, does does living mean bodily survival? Does it mean that you're in a nursing facility? Um, does it mean that you have to be independent and able to walk, talk, and function? So it's there's a whole bunch of uh, kind of nuanced discussions that you have to have. But if if you can't even approach the topic, then it's it feels very um, uncomfortable. Yes, and you did point out in the book though that. For for your sister and for her husband, Pat, there were literally hours and hours of conversations that were held um, with with their doctors and with the palliative care team. And so some some compassion there for for doctors that many doctors in practice don't really have the time to mm -hmm. have these detailed and nuanced conversations as you're as we were talking about. Well, one of the things I think that's that's uh, unfortunate is that hospice and palliative care oftentimes gets involved too late, and I found that for both my sister and for um, and for Pat, that uh, when palliative care got involved in when he was in the ICU after his brain hemorrhage, it was mainly uh, decision of stopping or, uh, withdrawing treatment and terminal care issues. And there were a lot of them. It was still like a two or three hour conversation, but it would have been helpful to have, to have had them involved all along in making decisions and guiding treatment. And so I think there's a general reluctance to get hospice involved uh, because it's a sense that you've decided not to pursue additional treatments. And sometimes I think that that could be brought in a, a whole lot earlier in a parallel track where people do have the time and the availability to discuss uh, their care and, and kind of life and death issue. Oh, I agree with you. I definitely think the the types of care patients are receiving should be concurrent. It shouldn't be that you're in one type of care and then suddenly we shift you. Now you have entire, an entirely new team and with a completely different focus. We really do need to bring those tracks together so that patients are receiving palliative care all along. And it doesn't feel so jarring when the idea comes up that perhaps it's time to discontinue treatment because you already have a whole team that's been caring for you right. also. So you're not going to lose that palliative care team. They'll they'll stay with you when you make a, a a change. So one of the things I've been struck with is the, is the, is as a physician, I'm dealing with cognitive issues and also emotional issues. And that sometimes I feel that we use the cognitive script, which can be very uh, consuming and very detailed. You know, 
what uh, what's going on physiologically, what's happening to, uh, biologically, what's happening with your treatments, how are the treatments working? There's just a huge amount of data and information, but the subtext of sort of emotional experience, emotional reaction, how you deal with this um, is often neglected and not really addressed. And I feel that sometimes as I've aged a little bit in medicine, I've kind of realized that that's actually oftentimes as important, sometimes more important than some of the cognitive information. And that if you don't address the underlying emotional issues, uh, fear, um, defense, uh, you know, a uh, lot of different things, you know, then you don't really, you're not really fully treating um, the patient. And I think that gets into the whole compassion part. And what I saw when I was on my sister's side of the bed rail was that it was just um, those emotional experiences, those emotional needs are pretty profound and pretty, and really need to be addressed and not just uh, pushed away or, or ignored in favor of all the statistics, data, and treatment decisions. And one thing that uh, you brought up in the book, which I've witnessed as well, is that I think a lot of doctors want to be distanced from patients and kind of want to put up a wall around themselves emotionally because they fear that they'll get burned out if they have too deep a connection with their patient. And that in reality, um, I think you brought this up, but I, I see this as well. It's, it's not being able to connect with patients that probably causes more burnout than finding a, a comfortable amount of empathy to have with patients. So did I did I get that right? At what you I think were you did, and I, I think to me to me that was one of the real big discoveries that I made in myself, but also that I wanted to communicate in in the book, which is that the if you look at people burning out, it's it's not the exposure to sadness and uh, loss that is the cause of burning out. It's actually that defensiveness and desire to avoid emotions, these intense emotions. Um, one of the things is a lot of times we uh, avoid, that when we avoid emotions, um, we actually give them more power. And so sometimes facing them and, for example, crying or having an intense emotional experience ultimately is, is freeing and, and rewarding and connecting emotionally with your patient is, is oftentimes a very gratifying. So finding, uh, but it does take some courage, you know, because initially you, you, I was taught to be distant and detached and that I couldn't get emotionally uh, connected. And the problem is when you create this emotional armor to protect yourself from these intense emotional experiences, that ends up sort of dulling down your whole, the richness of your lived experience. You become less sensitive and less alive. So I found that when I did that, I couldn't turn it on and off. Yes, it maybe it protects you from these, you know, feeling badly, but it also takes away the highs and, and doesn't really serve you well. So I, dis I discovered, I actually was talking to a friend of mine, Helen Rice, who's a, a, a psychiatry professor at Harvard, and I, I was really struggling with this. I said, you know, how, how is it that I can have these intense emotional experiences, which I want to have because they are actually kind of a source of life and satisfaction to me, but then how do I go and the next minute take this patient to surgery and cut their head open and, and operate deep in their brain? And I realized that, that there's an extraordinary range of emotions that you need to have control over. Initially, I thought, well, maybe it's my job to be just a technician and leave the emotions to others. And then I realized that's a big mistake, that if you're not a compassionate surgeon, then you are doing things potentially that are really bad for patients, like over-operating or cutting corners or objectifying people. And there's a big push in current medicine of sort of financial productivity or doing procedures or being, you know, very um, focused on non-human aspects. So I realized, you know, if you lack compassion as a surgeon, I don't think you're going to be that good a doctor. So how, how, do you, how do you flex between these states? And so one of the things that I really wanted to communicate in this book is that we need to have emotional agility. We need to be able to go from profound, having profound meaningful connected discussions and then be able to flex to ex to a, a complicated or different set of emotions i realized that 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 emotional agility 
allows us to see that life's beauty is inseparable from its fragility. So you get a sense of the richness of life. You get in a much more intense experience, exposure and connection with patients. But at the same time, you're able to flex uh, to a, a pretty extreme range of different emotional experiences. And so I found that to be a really uh, liberating because it really did, uh, I really did struggle trying to sort, sort this all out. Uh, and I found when I saw that and learned about it, I felt that I, this, was a, this was a valuable lesson or a valuable uh, piece of information to pass to people because I think it's crucial for doctors to have empathy, compassion, you know, to suffer alongside their patients, but not be armored and defensive, but be able to have emotional agility to connect and to go through these range of experiences. Ultimately, it's a much more satisfying uh, life to live. I feel that I'm living a much richer experience. I found that my patients really know that I'm on their side. They know that I am uh, in their camp and it just feels so much better as a physician. And I feel that if I, by letting go of the whole um, distance and detachment part, I become not only a better doctor, but a happier person. I love this idea of emotional agility. And, and I can speak as someone who's in a way coming at it from the opposite direction that I came to medicine with a huge open heart and lots of compassion and empathy. And I almost had to learn to go the opposite direction. I had to learn how to compartmentalize my emotions a little bit so that I could be more objective and not be constantly overwhelmed by, by feeling all the emotion of what was happening around me. But the fact is, there was no one there to help me with that or teach me that or talk to me about it. I, I learned it the hard way over time. And I know that's that's something that um, that I read that you care about that, too. How are we training medical students and residents? And why do we why do we get no education whatsoever around around emotions and these difficult issues that we have to grow with, deal with? And also grief. That's that's another issue I see we're not trained how to deal with our own grief. Well, we're, we're trained to bury grief. You know, when I did um, morbidity and mortality uh, conferences as a neurosurgical resident, it would have been shameful or suspect to have expressed sorrow at the loss or death of your patient. And I just think that's really messed up. You know, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> I look and I say, we talk endlessly about the anatomy, the physiology, you know, how your brain is wired, but we, we have kind of sucked the humanity out of it. And it just, it isn't right. And it doesn't make for good doctors and good human beings. So I, I really feel, you know, one of the reasons I wrote the book was to, to get this message out. Um, but also I really want to get into the world of medical schools. And, and I also think, you know, I, I had a conference with a nursing group um, this last weekend, and I think they were very receptive to what I was talking about. But I also felt that their nursing training is, is far more uh, comfortable with empathy and with the emotional side of practice. And for some reason, the whole um, scientific pretense that, you know, emotions aren't scientific and need to be extracted, which I don't think is true. And if you read something like Compassionomics, which I don't know if you have you seen that book? No, I haven't. So Compassionomics is a, is a book about the scientific basis for empathy and compassion. And so I think that this idea that if it, that there is no scientific basis for empathy and compassion, is kind of an, an add on at the end. And I think that misses the whole point. Actually, compassionate care is better care. Patients do better. They have better outcomes. They are happier. Uh, and the practitioners are also happier. So there is a scientific basis for compassion and compassionate care. And so I think that that has to be one of the drivers of how we, how we deliver care and how we think about patients and how we think about health systems and how we, how we organize things. And it starts as a very kind of um, seemingly sort of um, simple idea but it is a really profound one with far reaching implications. You have to look and say, well, how, how, what would, what would our health system look like if it was based in compassion? How would we do things differently? How would we organize 
um, the care that we give, the, the, the surgeries that we uh, provide, and things would really start to change a lot. So I, I feel that getting in front of uh, medical students, getting in front of nursing students, talking to health professionals, and, and saying, not only is it all right to feel emotionally connected and in, in, in invested in, in what you're doing, it's actually preferred. And it is normal to feel sad and to feel uh, loss, and you have to go through it to be a, a, a functioning, integrated, compassionate, and decent person. And I think there's a component of this, which we haven't discussed, which I think is actually vitally important, because one of the things is not only are we defended against emotional uh, experiences and connecting, but what we do is we actually are kind of we're taught to be sort of mean to ourselves. We're taught to um, to deny these things as important. And so I think that one of the parts of emotional agility is the, a requirement for self-compassion. So we have to be able to, you know, we I as a neurosurgeon am expected or expect of myself perfection, but perfection is not attainable. I'm going to have complications. I'm going to have bad results. I have to be honest with my patients. I have to be accepting of those within myself. I can't uh, just sort of say, well, this is, uh, you know, either deny it or push it away or try not to uh, accept it. That if you aren't self-compassionate, if you don't forgive yourself for inevitable mistakes, you can't be uh, compassionate towards others. So I think this is one of the, these are crucial things. And I feel that you know, there's a hidden curriculum in medical training. You look at the curve of people start as empathetic initially and then become less and less empathetic. And some of that is it's sort of knocked out of people, but also um, there's a lot of negative role modeling that's going on in training and that needs to change. And uh, we need to build on empathy rather than uh, squelch it. Wow, such good points. I'm so I'm on the bandwagon with you on all of these points. And I do think I, I, I mean, you, you expanded your mind and your heart later in life in your medical practice. It did you didn't get this from your medical training. But how perfect would it be if we could start with young doctors brand new to medicine and train them in this way. But you could at least give them you could at least give them the language mm -hmm. and you could give them the concepts and you could say, you know, you're going to feel sad and you shouldn't bury it or run from it or ignore it or pretend it doesn't exist or go get drunk or do something, you know, to avoid it, you know, with um, and that the way to have a richer life and a richer professional experience is to connect emotionally and that you have to go through these things. It's okay to be sad. It's normal to be sad. In fact, I think it's preferred to be sad. And, and what's sort of ironic is that I initially was very afraid of, of, you know, crying in front of a patient and, you know, expressing myself emotionally. And then when I did, I felt much better. And I also felt much more connected with my patients and, and I became far, it's strange, but I became far busier. Like I've got a lot of people, wanting to come see me because they know that I am kind of a, a good doctor. And I don't, I don't think it's really the technical issue. It's more the kind of the, the, the care issue. And I think you're exactly right. I think that when patients are going through a challenge or a crisis in their lives, they desperately want to know that the person caring for them understands them emotionally and isn't just a technician or a computer handing out statistics and information, but actually gets them and gets all of the aspects of who they are as a person. And I think, I think some of the ways, some of the ways we do things, you know, there's this sort of macho kind of neurosurgical, like take out a really big complicated tumor or, or um, clip a difficult aneurysm. And I just think that's sort of, I mean, I guess that's some, that has some merit, but a lot of it is, it's not very human, you know, that, that, that tumor is in someone's head and um, that aneurysm, that complicated aneurysm is potentially life-threatening in this person. And so I, I just feel that the distancing and objectifying of people is really dangerous and damaging. Um, but I do think that people, I do think that people need help and, and surgeons, I think, but, all, but really all doctors, they need help about how to, how to experience the range, how to, how to be emotionally available and connected and at the same time 
be able to uh, focus and maintain com uh, compassion and say in the operating room, but at the same time still do very precise, uh, detailed um, surgical things. And I think it, it does require training. And I just find it extremely bizarre that in these years and years and years of apprentice-based you know, residency training, not one bit of information was spent talking about these things. Yeah, I find, isn't that amazing and bizarre in a way? It's that... really strange. It's really strange. And, and the other thing is that, you know, uh, w one of the things I've really enjoyed in this, in this uh, journey is meeting people like yourself who get it and say, this is not where, how we're doing things is not the way to do things. And there's a better way to do them. There is a tremendous number of people out there with, who have similar views and similar feel very passionately about that. And I think one of the things that we have to do is to ignite the fire of compassion and say that this is not acceptable to continue in this current path and we need to change things. But I feel one of the things that's been, I would say a little bit frustrating to me, but it didn't really surprise me is that there's a lot of vested interest in keeping things exactly the same and not, in not rocking the boat and not looking at the emotional impact of what we do and keeping it that distance and that defended posture. And so it's, it's kind of difficult. It's very rewarding when you open your heart and you decide that you're, you're really kind of all in and really committed for, to compassionate care, but you pretty quickly hit your head against the ceiling of, well, we're not going to change this. Or, you know, you look at things like peer review or, or dealing with insurance companies or dealing with hospital um, regulations or sort of, you know, you look at say, how hospitals run things in terms of trying to maintain maximal financial productivity. And you quickly kind of realize that, that there would have to be a pretty significant change for the better and restructuring of the way we do things if we're going to do a better job taking care of patients. Yes, yes, I, I resonate with, with that feeling of of running into a brick wall in some ways. But I have to say how refreshing it is um, to meet you and be able to have this conversation together. And I think there would be some value in bringing together like-minded people within medicine who feel this way too, so that that we create some numbers around us. Because just speaking for myself, I felt like for a long time I've been um, on my own, <laughs> kind of yeah. with these thoughts and ideas and practicing the way I practice with patients, but in a way keeping it hidden from my colleagues and never being able to talk about it. And then I think, you know, we're, we're all comfortable doing our own thing alone, but how much more powerful would it be if we could come together and could be mentors for students who... Well, what I know is right now there are medical students out there who are probably suffering the same way I did because there's no one to talk to and yeah. there's no mentor who will say, this is how you handle this, the feeling of failure that you have right now right. or the grief that you're dealing yeah, with. Yeah, and failure is normal and it comes with the job and it's something you just got to get through, but you, you can't just, you know, ignore it or pretend it didn't exist. But, you know, I've talked with medical students um, at, at Chapel Hill at, um, Michigan at um, Columbia and um, with every one of them that I talk with, I feel, you know, cause I've heard that, Oh, medical school is getting better. You know, when you went to medical school, it was a long time ago and we are better at this. But when I talk to students, they say, no, we're not much better at it. We're not really addressing these things. Nobody's really wanting to turn a light on it. And in fact, I had, I talked to one person who was running the curriculum uh, for medical school and said, well, the, me the medical school curriculum is full. We just can't add something new. And I look and I go, you can't afford not to add this. You know, you've got to figure out some way to structure some of the other stuff so that you address these issues. But these are not, these are not just like add-ons and little things that are just on the side. These are like, these are fundamental existential issues of how you are going to practice your entire life. How do you interview patients? How do you connect with patients? How, and, you know, for example, my mentioned my friend, Helen, well, she has a, she has a validated process of teaching, training, empathy. So empathy can be taught. Um, emotional agility can be taught, but these are not things that you can just learn. You know, I, I don't think you should have to go through some personal crisis to then figure out how to do things differently. Why not just train people from the outset? Because 
one of the things I was trying to say in my book when I interviewed um, patients and physicians is my story was painful to me and it was important to me and it sets the scene for the conversation I wanted to have, but it's not unique. I'm not special. What, what I went through, lots of people go through. They go through very difficult, painful, emotionally wrenching experiences, and there should be a way to integrate that personally and professionally so that there's not such a dichotomy between patient and doctor. You know, for example, I'm, we're all going to become patients. You know, we're all going to die. Uh, these conversations, these topics have to be shared uh, across patients and doctors. We're not, you know, we, we like to distinguish ourselves and that's the patient. I'm the doctor. Well, so, hey, someday you're going to be the patient. And I, I like the thought, I was thinking of the idea that palliative care should be a concurrent track for patients that they're receiving palliative care while they're receiving other care. But that just struck me that in medicine, maybe we shouldn't be trying to carve out a separate two week block for students where they learn about emotional agility and empathy, mm -hmm. but we should have a concurrent track for students, regardless of what, whatever rotation they're going through, there's a concurrent track happening that entire time of someone who's talking about the, the emotional issues and the empathy that, that they're, they're trying to learn how, how to have for patients. So it's ongoing no matter what else they're learning. Well, I think it's also strange. I, I've talked about this in the book, but I just think it's strange that, you know, I'm in an interview based um, profession where I had some limited initial training in interviewing. And then after that, I had none. And I've never had any refreshers. I've never had anyone sit through like as a an established professional. I've never had anyone come and watch me interview a patient and critique my interviews. I've never had them recorded where I can look back and say, well, did I do a good job? Did I accomplish what I set out to do? And you look and you go, there's all this time pressure. There's all this, you know, conflicting. It's a very complex thing, interviewing a patient, trying to get to the emotional um, issues, but also dealing with, as I said, the tremendous amount of cognitive information. And, and we need to be able, as practitioners, I'm not the same guy that I was 20 years ago when I graduated medical school. I should be able to go back. There should be refresher courses. There should be opportunities to kind of relearn, to look at how you're doing things. I just think it would be extremely powerful to revisit these things throughout your career because as you grow and change and, um, and uh, develop, you're going to have different thoughts and needs and ideas. And I feel that those kinds of things would be very good in the service of preventing burnout and allowing people to feel energized and invested and and that they're growing still growing in their job oh that's so true such a good point and and when you were talking about not gaining any interview skills i mean i had I had more training in how to do an interview to become a podcast host than I did for being a doctor, <laughs> you know, which is Isn't that weird? ridiculous. It is strange. It's strange. And then because the thing is, we're all living, we're all existing in, their, in our own little bubbles. And one of the things that I found really riveting when I did this book was I realized that the experience that I had with my sister, with Pat, was very disruptive to me, but it's something that Every one of those people that I talked to had either experienced it as a patient or experienced it as a doctor, and they've had far-reaching implications. But to a person, no, not one of those people discussed it. They didn't talk about how these wrenching experiences had reshaped their thinking and their existences and how they their relationships. And yet, to a person, they, they had profound implications. So I just thought, how strange it is that we go through these wrenching emotional experiences kind of on our own. You know, we, we generally don't talk to people about grief. You kind of take a, you take a pass, right? You say, I've got to step away for a bit because my mother or my family member died, but you don't, you, there's no process of integrating those experiences back into your life. And yet you look and, and I look at, for example, with the coronavirus, you know, we've all experienced grief. We've all seen disruption. It's a tremendous impact. And yet, you know, do we discuss it? Do we think about how it's impacting us? Or do we just try to paper it over and pretend that everything's fine and go back to business as usual? I just think it's kind of strange. Yeah, I've been thinking during this past year that COVID has really given us this opportunity that, I mean, this may be 
an opportunity like we've never had before to actually start to bring up some of these conversations because we've seen the medical staffs becoming just completely exhausted and devastated in a way they may not have faced before. And it seems like we're at a, if you want to call it a teachable moment right now, when this would be the time when we might be able to start some of these conversations if, if we only knew how to do it. Yeah, well, I think it's absolutely imperative because I think that it's, um, I mean, I just find it very strange how people are behaving that, you know, it's not, you know, I, the, the conclusion of my book is about uh, compassion in the coronavirus. And, and I was glad to be able to include it because I learned a lot from that experience. But it's very strange if you have a culture where uh, people are the medic, you can't have one group handle the burden for the entire culture. You know, you can't have, um, I thought at the very beginning, you know, when people weren't wearing masks, but then were celebrating the healthcare workers, it's like the, the compassionate thing is to wear a mask. It's not, it's not to, you know, bang a pot and say, thank you. It's, it's, it's everyone, everyone's all in and we all need to share, um, the burden, the loss, the the sadness. It, you, if you start just pushing it onto one group, say the healthcare worker, and say, "Well, you know, this is yours to bear," that's that will cause burnout, and that will cause alienation. That will call, cause people to leave uh, the practice of medicine. Hmm. That's so true. So this is really a time when that integration needs to happen, that healthcare is something everyone has a stake in. It's not just on the shoulders of doctors and providers and you know, nurses. It's it's our whole community. We're in this together. Right. And so so we need to integrate that compassion and care for one another throughout medicine, but also throughout our communities and our society. Right. I agree. And, 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 you know, I've done some things. So um, I, I work with an organization that's called One World Surgery, and we go to Honduras, and now we're going to Dominic, Dominican Republic. And for me, it's been so uplifting to go to this, these communities that have no medical care, access to medical care. And we, we go and we provide surgical missions and provide uh, 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 spinal surgery and all kinds of uh, medical care for these people in desperate need. And the level of um, satisfaction that I get from that is just so huge. The, the, the kind of, because it's really sort of compassion in, it, it, it is all about compassion. So I, I think that we can do better, but there are opportunities to, to, to be able to do this well. Yes, definitely. Well, um, your book has kind of lit a fire under me. I'm so glad we got a chance to talk about it today. And uh, I, I, I agree with, we can do so much more. And really, those of us still within the profession who are awakened in a way, I guess, who see where we need to go, um, I'd love to see if there are th things we can do, ways we could work together and something we I, can I'm, do I'm, to I'm make so change. excited and I'm, I'm so enthusiastic that you that you read it and that you like it. And I'm really desperate to get the word out there because I think uh, the, the, the way we change is to start really tackling some of these issues and not just sort of put them off or, or, or try to ignore them. That's, that's not going to be an effective way of dealing with these things. Well, your book in particular, I mean, it's a book that anyone can read and benefit from, but I'm going to say this to all my listeners out there, um, this would be a great book to give as a gift to your doctor, because I think it's a, it's a really good book for doctors to read who I find oftentimes reject <laughs> other information ab about these issues, unless it comes from from a colleague. And so, you know, you speak in a language that doctors can understand and resonate with, and you get right to the heart of the issues in this book. So um, buy it to read for yourself, but get a second copy and give it to a doctor that you know and care about, especially someone that you think might be might be struggling a little bit and maybe needs to to hear some new ideas. I, and I also think that getting uh, people uh, need to to put these concepts, they need to think them through. They, you know, patients and, and people who are not physicians have a greater impact and can, and can spur on change more than they realize. So if you have a doctor who is not compassionate, find another one. If you're not happy with the care that you're getting, you know, I think that we have a tendency to be afraid, intimidated, and sort of uh, just accept what's happening. 
and I don't think we should or need to. And I, so I think we need to speak up and and speak with our with our feet. You know, if we're if we're happy and we have a compassionate doctor and we like that relationship, then support that person. And if you're not happy with that, you don't need to put up with it. Hmm. That's very true. And and really, the changes that we'd like to see in medicine in some ways may need to be patient driven. Not that I'm putting the responsibility on patients. But that's half of the equation, and we can't right. leave that out. It's really right. important exactly for patients right. to feel empow- empowered, to speak up, and to talk about how, how how does it feel when it seems like your doctor's dismissing you and walking away from you and not answering your questions. And- it's not to me, it's not acceptable. And and I just found that um, when I was on the receiving end, it was like, uh, I, I felt as if I had gone from seeing in black and white to suddenly seeing in color. It was like, wow, you know, this, this is not good. It doesn't feel good and it could be better and it needs to be better. Absolutely. I know that one thing you're doing, you have a palliative care practitioner embedded in your practice. Is Am I correct about that? Yeah, in, the, in our brain tumor program. And it, it's been absolutely fascinating because, uh, you know, some of the, I think we talked about the cognitive and emotional. I, a lot of things, sometimes we don't listen enough. You know, we do a lot of talking and a lot of information dumping and not so much listening. And I find that getting information from someone who's maybe not directly in the treatment team about all the issues that surround a person's decision making is enormously helpful. And I've, I've begun to wonder, I begun to realize that I think I know my patients and I really do make it a habit, a, a point to ask them about their jobs and their lives and their personal lives. But I, I'm always surprised at how little I understand mm-hmm. and how that person, that person brings uh, a tremendous amount of detail and insight into what, into why people make decisions, the decisions that they make. You're so right. A team approach, which I learned through doing hospice work, where we we work as a team always. Um, it's supportive team, it, and it's helpful, isn't it? It's a yeah, better way to do things. So much better care. I can't tell you how many times it was the volunteer who at our team meetings would be the person who actually knew the most about the patient, who had this crucial information that none of the rest of us had picked up on. It was right. the volunteer who had just been there casually sitting with the patient and family. And so, um, yes, I'm, I'm all for that. We need the team approach. And I like the idea of embedding palliative care into every specialty, really, and um, having that just that perspective available in our care. Well, I, I really appreciate you reaching out to me. And I also really appreciate what you're doing because I think you're making a difference and you're making an impact. And I think that uh, we can and need to do better and we need to rethink things and change how we do things. And if everyone approaches it with an open heart and a willingness to see things differently and to experiment a little bit and to, not come in with foregone conclusions, we could do so much better. Absolutely. And I want to remind listeners out there that your book is titled Grief Connects Us, A Neurosurgeon's Lessons on Love, Loss, and Compassion, uh, which I know it's available on Amazon and probably bookstores everywhere if uh, someone uh, wants to buy the book, and hopefully a lot of people will. And the, your website is josephsternmd.com. And I saw that people can sign up um, to get your newsletter and be part of your virtual community there, which I would encourage people to do as well. And then Jody, do you have anything else, any events coming up that where people might have a chance to meet you or hear you speak? Well, if you're in Greensboro, I'm going to be doing uh, a book event in at Scuppernong Books in Greensboro. Uh, I'm going to be on Kevin MD on a podcast, uh, and um, I'm going to be speaking to the University of Pennsylvania Neurosurgery Department in their grand rounds. Uh, and I'm I'm anyone who wants to uh, get me in front of medical students or have me talk, I'm happy to go. Absolutely. And that's what I'm hoping this this interview might spawn even more opportunities for you to speak and oh, particularly to students. That's that's the audience that we really need to reach out to. Yeah, they're our future and they're not, they don't have the bad habits and they, they are willing and interested in learning and and uh, bring a, an energy that I find uh, engaging and infectious.
Yes, absolutely. Well, what what an absolute pleasure it's been to talk with you, Jody. I want to thank you so much for taking time out. I know how busy you are, so I'm I'm really grateful we had this chance to talk. And I am very grateful to you, so thank you for inviting me. All right. Well, I hope we can stay connected and we'll see what the next steps are thank on you, uh, this project. Thanks a lot. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Dr. Jody Stern. I was really delighted to have a chance to talk to him. I don't very often get to talk to like-minded physicians who care a lot about the doctor-patient relationship and who value the importance of compassion and connection between doctors and patients. And so it was really delightful for me to get acquainted with him and I'm sure that we will continue to stay connected in the future. But one thing, I didn't really talk about this much during the interview. One thing that really resonated with me was when he said that we physicians need to learn how to forgive ourselves. Now, that's true for our society as a whole. All of us need to learn how to forgive ourselves. But for me personally, something that I'm working on in depth right now in my own life is this idea of self-forgiveness. And I'm working on, on it as a doctor, a daughter, a wife, a mother, a sister, a friend, and really looking at all of the things that I continue to blame myself for or feel ashamed about, all of the things that I actually hate myself for, and I'm working really hard to let go of those things. And I just recently recorded a podcast episode for my other podcast, which is called What Really Matters Podcast, and it's all about everyday spirituality. So I did a whole episode on self-forgiveness, which I actually think that's airing this week on that podcast. And when Jody mentioned that we doctors need to forgive ourselves as well, that struck a really powerful chord for me and helped me remember all of the times when I felt like I didn't do enough or questioned if I'd done the right thing for a patient. Times when the outcome wasn't what we had hoped, when I blamed myself. And sometimes when I did everything in my power to the best of my ability, and yet still the outcome wasn't what the patient wanted or what I had hoped for. And so he really validated for me the fact that we do tend to blame ourselves for things that haven't gone well in the past, and we carry that blame throughout life. And I'm discovering right now, I'm in the middle of this process of working on self-forgiveness, uncovering all of the hidden shame that I've carried my entire life, and I'm finding just how freeing it is to deal with that. So uh, it, it was delightful for me to hear him bring that up as well. It really resonated with what's happening in my personal life. And I did want to just uh, encourage you to go take a listen to my episode on self-forgiveness on What Really Matters podcast. I'll leave a link for that podcast in the show notes for this episode so that you can find it there if you're interested in listening to it. So a quick reminder to be sure to share this podcast, End of Life University, with other people if you feel like they might benefit from listening in to this content. It's also helpful if you subscribe and leave a rating and review wherever you happen to be listening to podcasts, because we're trying to grow this audience of people who care about end of life issues. So I hope you will be sure and spread the word as you go forward. Be sure to tune in next Monday for another episode. I'll be talking with Kevin Hines about suicide, which is a a very powerful subject. So join us next week for that next interview. Until then, remember that we're here for love. That is the most important thing we can bring to light in this world. So face your fear Be ready for whatever happens next and love each and every moment of your life. Bye-bye.